Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. So today, we are honored to be sitting down with Rocky Mountain House Councillor Tina Hutchinson. But before we dive into the interview with Councillor Hutchinson, a brief moment to remind everyone of our newest show, Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown, where we dive into the biggest news stories municipally from across Canada, with interviews with local leaders and discussions that are on everyone's mind. We have you covered every Monday. Search Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown on Spotify or visit the Cross Border Interviews YouTube channel and watch the latest show there. Now, on to the interview. Um, Councillor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it and greatly appreciate it for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and talk about yourself, but also the community of Rocky Mountain House. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me. So, um, Tina, I want to start with the basic question, and it's the question I've asked every single municipal councillor who's ever come on the show. So you're really no exception to this question. In I, I was going to say in your opinion, but that's the last question I asked. But the first <laughs> question I ask is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Tina? I, I think I have to go back to, you know, when the kids were little and volunteering. Um, I was always managed to get into the board position of president as I found it was easier being the president because if you delegate, you don't have to actually do quite so much. Um, so from play school to soccer to I coached volleyball or pardon me, basketball for a couple of years uh, for my daughter's team. And it just was something that, you know, you're a mom, you you jump into those positions. And then um, when we did move to Rocky Mountain House, I didn't, not having kids in the community, you're not as involved. And uh, so I kind of focused on on the business that we had at the time. And it was a, a wireline company in the oil patch, which was a man's world and gave me some thicker skin than I might not have had prior to that. Um, and then the Masters Games came upon me. So we hosted the 2019 Alberta Master Games here. And that was two and a half years of, of volunteering and committing to the community. Um, so it, so it's at that time I, I got to, after that was all said and done and then COVID hit. So I did nothing for a couple of years but <laughs> for them, for the most part, just being part of the community and, and, and enjoying to see the community come together as a, as a whole. So we'll talk about the community and your role as counselor here in a few minutes, but I want to get to know who Tina is because we often don't realize who our municipal councillors are. We know that they sit around a tech council table, but really at the end of the day, we just don't know. Did you ever think growing up, I want to be a politician? This is something I would always want to be. I've always wanted to be a town councillor or a mayor or an MPP or a MLA or an MP, or was politics even discussed in the household growing up? You know, it, it's not that I remember. Um, I'm the youngest of eight kids and supper table was, you know, you I, you get as much as you can to eat and you get in and you get out kind of thing. But um, yeah. But it's, so you, you, you never really, it was oh. never a desire for you to become a politician and this was just a step in giving back to your community in some sense? Exactly. I, I never, never had the desire, never had the thought um were you politically again, engaged were you engaged no. in your communities oh wow no no it was really during covid where i would spend hours watching council meetings here trying to figure out what is going on in our town and and is it what you know you hear the rumors to be and, and things like that so i would i would spend time researching and it just when the election came up i thought hey I can do this. I think it's, I think it's a door that uh, that I can open and and uh, jump in with two feet. So I, I've got to ask that question then to follow up on that just statement that you just said there. 
Was it an easy decision? Was it a simple decision for yourself to say, okay, this is Tina's time. This is time for Tina to get on this council. I've been watching what's going on at council and I see how I can play a role in bettering our community, but also bringing a different perspective to council that may not be there that I've seen on these council meetings. I had the ups and downs where I would, you know, second guess myself and, you know, I think, yeah, I can do this. And then the next day it was, no, I can't do that. And um, I, I spent time with one of the county councillors and, and got her perspective on things and how things worked. And it just kind of got to the point where, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to jump in and, and do it. So. I'm not speaking out of turn here where I can say a special shout out to Clearwater County uh, <laughs> a counselor, Michelle Swanson, am I? Absolutely. It was Michelle. Yeah. So that was, and we worked on the games together and that's kind of where our friendship started. And, um, you know, just, just having somebody that you can, you know, kind of mentor from and, and uh, again, the County and, and town run, I mean, completely different. I, I didn't realize how different it was until I went to my first RMA conference and got a real different appreciation for um, the rural municipalities because it is a whole different uh, uh, structure. Well, it, it, yeah, yeah, for sure. You, so you put your name forward in 2022 in the October election, literally almost two years to the day from when this is going to be airing in September. So two years ago, you yeah. put your name forward to uh, to run for town council. You go out and start talking to your community members. Yes, it's a little different campaign than traditionally because it's COVID still. Uh, there's not a lot of people interacting as much as a traditional campaign. But when you were knocking on doors, do you remember what issues you were hearing about? Were they the issues that you thought you'd be hearing about? Or were they issues that were sort of not shocking, but surprising to hear? Well, it, it, it was a little bit different for me. Um, I actually focused on our, our businesses. Um, I didn't do a lot of the door knocking in town. And to be quite honest, I think a lot of small town uh, municipal elections or a popularity contest a lot of it isn't necessarily you know, I, I i'd probably have to agree with you on that and i think there's a lot of counselors who are listening to this who would also <laughs> agree with that statement yeah yeah for sure it is um i found it quite interesting though going to the businesses that a lot of our business or main street business owners are county residents and felt that they should have a bigger say on what goes on in the town because they're, they're, oh, I'm sorry, my email's buzzing over here. Oh. Um, yeah, so so it was interesting finding that out. Um, there wasn't a lot of, I mean, it was the regular stuff that everybody talks about. I'd go for a walk and it's, you know, people are, oh, the walking path had a little ice on it or, or garbage. We, we struggled with, with the garbage issue. Um, because the town and county had an agreement and that agreement expired. And so the town moved forward with our eco center. And so that was a really um, major battle between residents. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of issues that shocked you then. It seemed like it was a pretty straightforward cut and dry. Here are the issues. Here's what are, is on people's minds. And there was nothing that really stuck out to you. Uh, no, there wasn't. Not not a whole lot. No. So you get elected, and I'm I'm going to ask this question because you brought up the popularity issue. So I'm going to ask this question: How popular did you feel on election night when you got elected, and that blue check mark was beside your name, and you were officially councillor elect for Rocky Mountain House? I felt pretty good considering I, I think I got the third highest. Um, one of the other counselors has is a realtor whose face is uh, all over the town. So he's well known, um, you know, and, and with with our we had three running for mayor. And of course, that split three ways. Um, so there were a number of counselors that had more votes than than what any of the mayors did or, or the candidates had for that. But um yeah, it was it was quite surreal because you go in there and you vote for yourself, and that was 
like, so what was that experience like for you then? Because I can imagine, I remember my first election, I seeing my name on that ballot. I can tell you it's the most surreal thing. And every time I've put my name on the ballot, it's still surreal because you're literally, you, you, you're you guaranteed at least one vote because people can tend to not tell you the truth at the doors or when they're telling you, but you know, you get one vote. So for you putting that X or that check mark beside your name, what was that moment like with you? Was there a little bit of an apprehension of saying, what if I don't do a good enough job? What if I don't? do what I've promised people who I've talked to. Was there any apprehensive when you saw that name on that ballot? No, I think I was more worried, will I get any votes? <laughs> um, I can, you know, I, I wasn't born and raised here. We've been here 17 years, 18 years, I guess. And I'm not going to say that, that it's almost like there's two separate groups in town. There's the the people that have been born and raised here. And then there's the people like myself and, you know, my neighbors in the neighborhood, they, they don't know the history of so-and-so owns this land and somebody did this back then. And, you know, the, the, the history, the back history, I just wanting to be looking forward. So I'm, I, I wasn't somebody that when I walked into the polling station that had a lot of people even know who I was. So it was my picture on the sign that they first noticed and remembered the name. So back to the popularity vote. <laughs> so you get elected. So you're elected the next town councillor for Rocky Mountain House. And there is a weight that councillors have to put on themselves to sort of be engaged, but be prepared because you get thrown into the deep end. The moment you get elected, you basically have a two-week grace period where you do orientation, and then budget deliberations happen. And then the big issues start happening, rolling out. Now, this election, you do see a big turnover at your council table as well, a, a bit of a turnover at the council table. You have a new uh, elected mayor. You you have yourself. Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's two other new councillors as well on the Yes. Council table. Okay. So you're relatively a new council in the sense that there's a bit of changeover. Looking back on those first few months in office, what was the biggest educational piece that you took away from that experience? I think, well, I mean, it was a couple of weeks in, and our major, first major decision was uh, whether or not we were going to be purchasing a new fire truck. <laughs> So that was that that was um a good learning curve because I'm the type who wants information. I need to research and find things out. So I went and, and did the thing that you're not supposed to do, and I contacted uh the director of, of the department to get more information. And then we get an email two days later and, and uh CAO says, uh, Councillor Hutchinson, um, it's inappropriate for you to be going that direction <laughs> and speaking directly to, and it was a county director as well. So that, that was a, that was a bit of a learning curve, but I've never done it again, right? We always remember, you learn from your mistakes. But it was a very, it just so much to take in at one time. And I thought I had to know absolutely everything. And, you know, from then to now, you know, I've kind of found a, a direction uh, that I'm more interested in, like the the recreation board, I sit on that, the senior housing, Rocky Learning Council, things like that. So I'm, I'm learning to focus on, you know, a handful of things instead of trying to figure out the entire process. Well, while you're not trying to figure out the entire process, you have to vote on the entire process as well, because mm -hmm. you, you have issues that come forward to you that I'm assuming you probably didn't think you'd be dealing with in f the four years that you were on elected council. But here you are. You're an elected official and you're dealing with issues that come up on a day to day basis. How important is it for you? to be informed on what's going on in the community, be engaged with the community, but understand that you ultimately have to make the tough decision at the end of the day of raising taxes a percent, 2%, uh, buying that new fire truck, uh, dealing with a uh, water main break and trying to figure out how you're going to pay for it at the end of the year with your fellow councillors. How important is it for you to be engaged on all the issues, but not really entrenched in all the issues because your role as a counselor is policy 
and administrations is direction or not sorry your role is direction of where administration should be going but not directing them on a day-to-day -day issue yeah it's it's tough to you know at the beginning not knowing which lane that that we're supposed to be in um i think the biggest struggle is educating the people that council isn't the one that's going to set that direction on how often the road is plowed or who's picking up the garbage and what time and things like that. So it's, um, you know, I, I try and, well, I'm, I'm probably the worst one on council when it comes to time. I have time. I'm at a point in my life where I have the time. That's why I did, you know, make the commitment to sit on council. But I, I typically spend probably double the time than some of the others on council do um, preparing, researching, um, just just educating myself so that I can turn it over to the public when I need to and know what actually is, is supposed to be going on and, and how things work. The role of the councillor is to engage with its residents as well. And you're quite good at it. I, I, I had the pleasure of meeting you in person in Rocky Mountain House over the summer. And I, you and I, uh, I think we, we passed a few people and you waved. And while we were sitting having a coffee outside of one of the coffee houses, you, you were telling me all the people who were walking by, oh, this is this person. They own that business. So it seems like you're engaged and you know the people of your community. How do you engage with people as a counselor to gauge their reaction and sort of their stance on issues? Or do you do that? Do you see your role as trying to make the decision best because they've elected you? Or do you see your role as someone who needs to go out and get feedback from residents on whether the town needs to do X or Y or Z issue first and compared to A, B and C issue? I think a lot of our town residents, I'm not going to say don't care, but... Is there an apathy? <sighs> That's my favorite word on this show for anyone who's been paying attention for the last two weeks on this <laughs> while these episodes have been airing. I love apathy. I love the word. So that's why I use it a lot. Um, there I go, losing my thought again. What was I on before I before you, you threw? Were, you you, yeah. you were talking about they don't care. It's not that they don't oh, care. They don't care. They, I don't think they. I mean, you get your handful on social media that are very um, vocal, and you always hear the negative more than you do the positive. Um, I don't. I'm not a counselor. That I'm. I'm not the one who goes in the grocery store and takes an hour because people are engaging with me, and I think that's just because again, not being a long time resident here, I'm not as well known as as some of the other counselors that, that have that um, problem with going into the grocery stores and whatnot. So I, I think that I'm there for people if, if they want to speak with me, but I don't get, you know, my email doesn't go crazy and, and you know, there's, it's odd that you say that as like 10 minutes ago, you're like, oh, my email's going crazy right now. Yeah, so no, getting... <laughs> we, had, I, I... we had garbage issues. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, but talking about that personal side of the, while you may not get um, people coming up to you at the grocery store and asking you about issues that are going on in council, your role is a 24 hour a day job. You are in your community when you, at the day after you make decisions. You're not in Edmonton. You're not in Ottawa after you make decisions. You are in your community. Um, do you have you found that grace period or that grace area where you can be Tina and you can be Councillor Hutchinson from time to time? Because when you go out to community events, I can imagine you're counselor. But there's probably some places where you do just want to go and you may not get them a lot, but you probably have gotten one or two or three or four where people will come up to you, whether you're out with a family member at a restaurant or even at a coffee shop and say, hey, can we talk about budget A or uh, item B that council is deliberating right now? And are you willing to engage with them there? Oh, absolutely. Um we had this, so we've got our market on Maine happens on Thursdays throughout the summer. And uh, that, that to get that engagement with the public, I had suggested at the beginning of the summer, why don't we put up a booth on market on Maine so that 
and have um, inviting our, our county partners to, you know, man the booth with us, just so that we can have that place for the people, for the public to come in and talk and, and ask those kind of questions. So that's been, it's been, I've, I've had fun doing it. We have our final one this week. So um, we'll see what kind of turnout we get for that. Well, hopefully it's good. I want to turn to my second segment here because I just realized we're about 20 minutes into the interview and I want to make sure we get into this uh, second segment here. And before I start this question line of questioning, I want to preface this segment by saying this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is just the counselor and I talking about her views on what's going on in the town today. So counselor. In your opinion, what do you see as the biggest accomplishment that the town of Rocky Mountain House has done over the last two years since you've been in office? Oh, it's the biggest accomplishment. Um, On the flip side of that, after while you're thinking about that, I'm going to be asking you about the challenges as well. So let's start with the accomplishments. Well, as much as I think some of the residents would disagree with me, I think it's, I think our eco center has been um, one of the greater uh, projects that we've done. We have gone from, um, you know, we're not a dump in town anymore. We have our garbage, our recycling, and our organics. Um, and that's been something that we've taken a lot of pushback from the community. You know, we just finally got our blue bins here, uh, I think it's two weeks ago, and we had always had the recycle pickup in the bags, and it was like, why do we need bags? Now I got to spend money on bags for this, and we got to do that. And so that's a big educational piece, and, and that, that was quite a struggle. Um, what does I, that I think, mean for the town when you have that eco uh, center now? Eco center? Um, we just did a waste audit, and we haven't got the numbers back for that yet. But the reduction of of um, tonnage going to the to the landfill, we have our our organic our organics are being sent to Strickland Farms um, outside of Red Deer, and they um, we haven't I haven't taken a tour. Some of the past councillors had, but it's got the uh, they do the fertilization for their field and whatnot. Um, and then with our blue bins, that's going to a, a site down in. Calgary and it's just it's back to the education to you know you've got three bins now we actually have more pickup for people than what we used to but we still hear the argument that we need more garbage pickup people just aren't sorting through and whatnot um we were it's it's one of those double-edged swords right because as much as education as you can do and I I am a big proponent of municipalities communicating you can only communicate so much. Residents have to have buy-in as well, and they have to also accept that there is communication out there. They just have to look for it. And sometimes, this is my opinion, this is my statement here, sometimes yeah. they just don't want to do that. Yeah. Well, and we've also, we were one of, uh, we were the first community in Alberta to bring in the Clean Energy Incentive Program, the SEAT program. So that one was was a big, uh, wow. a big accomplishment. But, yeah, I did not was- know that. Yeah, that was started by um, previous council. So I think to date, I think we've had about 12 um, homeowners um, engaging in that program. Um, We've had another couple just very recent um, policies we've put through on developing incentive development for businesses. what else have we done? The non-residential tax incentive program we've just put into place. So those are big, big things that hopefully will, you know, continue on and add some growth into the community. So it seems like Rocky Mountain House is a happening place. There's a lot of things going on right now, but there's always the stumbles and every municipality has them. And I'm not picking on anyone right now, but in these conversations that I have across this country, even here in across Alberta, uh, I often ask, what is the biggest challenge that your municipality faces? So in your opinion, and again, this is the councillor's opinion, not a motion of council, not a direction of council. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing the uh, town of Rocky Mountain House today? Um, what I feel is the biggest challenge is 
so we've got a we've got an awesome main street beautiful main street they did a, the revitalization program a couple of years back we've got it's a lot really of, beautiful it's really yeah. beautiful <laughs> and it's unique you know a lot of places don't have a main street that 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 size but we've got a lot of um landowners that are along main street that aren't taking the pride I feel they should in the outside of their buildings as well as their inside. They're they're been bought and paid for a long time ago and they sit empty. And instead of doing something to to get renters in them, they're kind of an eyesore and and you know if your community isn't proud of you know the businesses and and the storefronts and things like that you know you don't get the buy-in from from other people to want to come to town and and grow the community so it's that's a that's to me that's a big struggle it's it's a handful of the same people owning those buildings and when you got renters in one and not the other well so be it so that's that's been i think that's a big struggle that we're dealing with one of the big struggles that a lot of municipalities are facing with right now is the housing crisis. Uh, a lot of people are still trying to build houses. Municipalities are on sort of the front lines of trying to build houses to get people to move in. Is there a housing uh, issue in the town of Rocky Mountain House right now? Do you, Or do you have developers knocking down your doors to try and build more development in your community? Well, we've got, actually, we just, there was, there was an extension needed from one of the developers here that came across the council table not too long ago. Um, we have the Creekside development that has, I don't quote me, I can't remember how many phases left to it. And they're, they're building to, um, um, what's the word when you, I, I can't think of the word. Uh, anyways, they've got, they've got developments um, going on there. There's another one that's closer to the area I live and they've put in, I believe it's three townhouses, like six unit homes. And wow. I think there's about four duplexes that are built in there. There's, there's still land to be developed and there's still developers going. Um, the town also has land owned just north of like on the north side of the town. Um, we, we did go through finding out whether or not it, you know, what, what it's going to be to develop that land and the cost. And it just, you know, unless we find a partner that's willing, but I, I don't know. I, I think we've got a lot of, you know, the affordable housing, but again, we've got landlords that aren't um, willing to keep it affordable. Uh, understandable. And that's an issue, not just in Rocky Mountain House, but across Canada as well. Yeah, I want I want to talk about the balance that you have as a counselor have to deal with and dealing with issues that are presented in front of council. You probably get requests from a lot of groups, a lot of organizations um, about fixing things, potholes, uh, adding hours to rec facilities or even outdoor playgrounds. But you know, and most people who are listening to the show know by now that municipalities do not have an unlimited supply of money. As much as we want them to, they don't. How do you make decisions on the best needs of what the city or the town needs compared to the individual? Because you can't forget about the individual needs and wants of your community, but you have to look at things as a Rocky Mountain issue, not just a Joe and Sarah issue. Yeah, it's it's a it's, that's definitely a struggle. Um, we've just we actually just passed a policy, a core services policy, which it, it, to go through that policy, you see that what are our requirements for the MGA, what are our wants, what are our needs, and it and it breaks it down for us to help us make those decisions that may be out of our reach. You know, it's the, 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 we've got the highways, major highways running through town. People think what the town isn't fi fixing those lights. They're not fixing the puddles. Well, it's not the town's property to be, to be fixing it. Um, so, you know, and I, our staff, shout out to them. They're amazing. Um, a lot of things were maybe not so great in Rocky a couple of years back. And, um, you know, the staff, 
has turned things around. Um, we're in a good financial position right now. We've got good long-term goals. And so when we're making decisions for, you know, the expansion of whatever it might be, um, we, we've got the plans in place to go forward. And, and we have to remember the decisions that we're making today are affecting the town in 10 and 20 years, and it's going to be our grandkids and, and so on and so forth. So to make sure that, that we're always keeping that in the forefront is, as we go forward. I want to turn to my last subject, and it's my favorite subject. It is my truly my favorite subject, and that is tourism. I love tourism. I'm a big proponent of Canadians spending their economic dollars here in Canada visiting some of these great communities. Now, I had the pleasure of coming up to Rocky Mountain House earlier this summer, as I said, and I got a little bit of a penny tour of downtown, and I went out to uh, the provincial park, uh, or the national park, sorry, just on the outskirts. But I want to, uh, I'm coming back. So I want to know from you, Councillor, what are the hidden gems that I need to see when I come through Rocky Mountain House again? Maybe it's the end of this month while I'm driving up to the Alberta Municipalities Conference. Maybe it's when I'm driving back. Maybe it's next summer. What should I see while I'm in there again? Well, you know, I uh, had the pleasure of my grandkids here this weekend, and we actually have a waterfall in Rocky Mountain House. I, I totally forgot to tell you about that one. It's a short walk, maybe a five minute walk um, by our water treatment plant. And I don't know, I'd say 30, 40 feet high, maybe it is. And that's something that even a lot of a lot of town residents don't know that's even there. So that's, that's kind of a nice little gem. Um, our walking paths are year round. The town does an amazing job keeping them clean, you know, throughout the winter as well as the summer. Um, we're expanding on our trail system, so you know, pretty much daily, I'm I'm on that trail. It's a six, just about a six-kilometer loop that that uh, neighbor and I take. Um, again, our main street is is unique. You can spend a lot of time just popping into all the different little stores, little unique little shops along the way. Um, you know, our location is is ideal. It's great. You've got. You know, we, we have our slogan, um, where adventure begins. I would like it to be where adventure is, <laughs> you know, rather than, than going up. We've got the museum. We've got the rec center. Um, the splash park is only two years old. The um, skateboard park is, I think, one of the oldest in Alberta. It was one of the first that was built. Um, we've got a group fundraising for a uh, pump track coming in, I oh, wow. think, probably 2020, late 2024, 2025. So there's, wow. there's, yeah, we've got a historical walk through downtown. You can go to the museum and it, uh, it's kind of like a little scavenger hunt thing when you walk along in the plaques along the building that gives you some history of the area. So and it's really cool too. Like when you were pointing those out to me while we were walking through the town, I kept on just being impressed on how frequent they are, but also how much uh, sort of history you kind of gleam from it. So highly recommend it to anyone who's uh, going through Rocky Mountain House. Stop and take an hour and go do that tour because you will not be sorely upset about that. So there's my shameless plug. <laughs> I think that, you know, the other thing is the people in town that, don't look at the town from that perspective, you know, and again, you can, I've, I've been trying to get council together with the county and doing the history walk through town, kind of do a little video competition between the two and see who, who gets the end. Faster. Who knows more? <laughs> Well, maybe 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 that's a special episode of the show where I get you and Councillor Swanson <laughs> on the show and see who knows more about the area. Right. Yeah, that, we could do that. Um, but what about yourself? After a long council meeting, after a long day of just being councillor, doing your day-to-day -day work, where do you go to decompress? Where do you go to just relax? And I, I joke about this all the time, but I'm going to hold it. I keep on holding the councillors and mayors. You cannot say your own home. You have <laughs> to say somewhere in your community because it tells me that you're willing to decompress in your community, not just in your house. But if you want to say your house, you can if you want. Well, Chris, when I come home from council meetings, I tend to pour a glass of wine and rewatch council <laughs> meetings. But <laughs> yeah, don't even go there. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, there's there's a trail down to the river. Um, it's two and a half kilometers from my house or return from my house, and and the a couple lookouts that are um, you know where the higher banks over top of of the river, and it's you can see the mountains from there. It's just a really nice. A nice little place where it's peaceful and quiet. But uh, if I do that and I come home, it's usually a glass of wine involved. To, <laughs> to, I'm seeing a to pattern here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to end on this last question because I'm cautious of time and we're almost at the 40 minute mark here. Uh, I want to know from you, in your opinion, and this was the question I was starting off with, but I screwed up. So I'm going to ask it a little bit better this time. In your opinion, what makes the town of Rocky Mountain House such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, the answer everyone always gives is the people. <laughs> uh, there, there's the, the people. When we first moved here, I was shocked at going for a walk and how many people greeted me. Um, you know, the other municipality I lived in, I went down the same walking trail and the same people and I never got a hi or a hello. And here it's, sometimes it's almost too much. <laughs> you want to have a quiet and it's, good morning, how are you? And, you know, they want to pet the dogs and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, like I, I started talking about the location where we're halfway between Edmonton and Calgary. You know, it's a 45 minute drive to Red Deer or 45 minute west and you're in the mountains. So, you know, we've got we, we've got lots of choices to do for a, a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. You know, we've got a couple of lakes, Crimson Lake, Cow Lake that are that are close enough. Um, the the camping in the area. And again, a big plug for Clearwater County because we are right smack tab in the center of the county. But, you know, that makes that makes you know, the town, the destination to, to be in and want to be in because you have that access to so many, so many things that are, you know, the, the West is absolutely gorgeous or you can go East and, and explore the, the prairies and farmland. So. I will be the first to say that getting to Rocky Mountain House is probably one of the most serenic drives I have do every time I take the cowboy trail. So for those who are not from Alberta who are listening to this or watching this, the cowboy trail runs uh, parallel to Highway 2, which is the highway from Edmonton to Calgary, and it's right on the cowboy trail. And it is one of the, if not the best highways in uh Alberta, in my personal opinion, because you literally are just driving and you look at the side of the uh, a car and you just watch the Rocky Mountains get closer or further away, depending on if you're going north. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and we have, um, so Alberta Tourism has done the destination zones and we actually fit into two. So we're on the Cowboy Trail and then we also are the David Thompson. David Thompson, of... I forgot about that. That's what I was going to yeah. ask you about. Thompson. Yes, that's. Yeah. So what that, is that's... what is with David Thompson? You you told me this while we met in person. I need to clarify this because I completely forgot. Because as you can tell, I forgot about it. Who's David Thompson again? And he's not the Wendy's guy. For those who are listening and saying, "Who's the Wendy's guy?" No, he's not. <laughs> um, David Thompson was well. He worked for the I think the Northwest um, Fur Trade Hudson Bay Fur Trade Company. Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then he went on to map out the um house pass he was the first one to go well he was attempting to go house pass so that would be saskatchewan river crossing directly west and got um stopped by again i'm not quite sure of which first nations it was and then he ended up finding the path the trailway that went north up through the Athabas um the ice fields parkway in that way to get into the, the BC um, trade route to get to the West Coast. Well, and this 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 shows you you need to shore up on your history of Rocky Mountain House before we have this competition <laughs> with between you and <laughs> Councillor Swanson. Um, Tina, I want to thank you 
I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know uh, it's always interesting to get a random message from someone to say, hey, do you want to come on a <laughs> podcast? But it's always greatly appreciated when people do. And I say this with res- uh, uh, respect and with complete honesty. Um, thank you. Thank you for serving your community. Thank you for putting your name forward. Thank you for doing what you do to make your community better. I think municipal politicians are often the forgotten politicians of our uh, country. So I want to start thanking them more often. So thank you so much for putting your name forward, serving in the capacity and making sure that your community is well off, not just for today, but for the future as well. So thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Cross-Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires both dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, stay talking.